Hare Krishna, welcome to the lockdown program with Krishna under the umbrella of Govardhan Hill. Today we are reading and discussing the most beautiful Srimad Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, Prakash, beautiful picture of Radha Ramanji, Hare Krishna. How are you? I am fine, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna, how are you? Thank you. Also very fine. We got a few nice days here in the UK, uh, some 20 plus degrees, 24, 25 even. What about in Delhi? Hot? Is it hot? Yes, hot. Like what? What kind hot. of temp? 45. 45! <laughs> Hare Krishna! That is a lot. Uh, I mean, we hear people complaining with 25, 28, and you have 45. Beautiful. What about the air pollution in Delhi? In this day, low. It's low at the moment. That is good. Okay, Brakash, did you did you watch the video at the end of last session? The Kunti video? Yeah, Kunti video. Prayer to Krishna. Okay, at the very end, right? Okay. Welcome, Brakash. Welcome, Dharm. Welcome, Samir. Hare Krishna. I hope you all well. Give me a second. We'll start with some Kirtan. We have apologies from Amit. We have apologies from Pandava. He has to do some important work. Uh, transaction with Bhagavati in Poland. So set. It's a reason why. Okay. Let's start off with a bit of Kirtan and let's see who else is attending tonight. Let's put some mobile, our mobiles on silent. Let's uh, don't start blaring off. And. Uh, Microphone a bit closer, like that. Hare Krishna.
हरे कृष्णा चाय हो राधा माधवा कुंज बिहारी गोपी जन वल्लभा गिरिद्वर धारे हरे कृष्णा वेलकम एवरीवन वेलकम प्रगाश from Delhi, very, very hot Delhi. Welcome Zemir from Africa, also pretty hot. Welcome Darm from Birmingham, Wolverhampton. And welcome Ben from Leicester. Hare Krishna. Welcome everyone for tonight's session on Srimad Bhagavatam. I hope you're feeling better, Ben, and I hope everybody is okay, feeling well and happily engaged in Krishna's service. Hare Krishna. So, before we start, maybe I have a little bit of some nectar to share. Let's have a look. We have apologies from Amit, and we have apologies from Pandava. Uh, Pandava he has some important transaction to do with Bhagavati who is in Poland and so that cannot wait, it's just the time. We don't have any apologies from Varshana, Nalini and Rashmi, so we don't know what is happening there. So, Hare Krishna. We have something about, here Srila Prabhupada, writes in a letter in 71, 1971. Every one of you should be thoroughly convinced of the power of the Hare Krishna mantra to protect you in all circumstances and chant accordingly at all times without offense. So again, here we have at all times, constantly, continuously, same thing. Again and again it comes up. Then advancement will be swift and you will gradually come to see everything clear so that you may act for the pleasure of the Lord without uncertainty. Of course, it is very important to chant without offenses. And we return back to that in a minute. When one is spontaneously engaged in this way, always in the service of the Lord, and anxious to avoid all mundane activities. He is actually experiencing the taste of bliss in Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna, I thought that was a very nice statement of Srila Prabhupada. And here is another one from an arrival address in London in 1969. Some of you are saying there is no God. Some of you are saying God is dead. And some of you are saying God is impersonal or void. <coughs> these are all nonsense. I want to teach all this nonsense that there is God. That is my mission. Any nonsense can come to me. I shall prove that there is God. That is my Krishna consciousness movement. It is a challenge to the atheistic people. There is God. As we are sitting here face to face, you can see God face to face. If you are, in, if you are sincere and if you are serious, that is possible. <coughs> Sorry. Unfortunately, we are trying to forget God. Therefore, we are embracing so many miseries of life. So, I am simply preaching that you have Krishna consciousness and be happy. Don't be swayed away by these nonsense waves of maya or illusion. That is my request. Okay, that was a little bit of Prabhupada. Nectar, let's jump to our Srimad Bhagavatam 1, 8, 27 we have tonight. Let's put it into the chat 1, 8, 27. We are on Queen Kunti's prayers. Here we are. It's in the chat 1, 8, 27. 
Samir and Ben, did you listen to the last class? And Prakash also? Was it helpful? I didn't get a chance to listen to it yet. Um, I was busy with a few other things, so... Okay. I will soon, though. Yes, do, do that. It's nice. There is a little bit of some uh, uh, three verses of uh, Kanamrita, uh, old city, Dasi, which deals exactly with Kunti's prayers, prayers by women. Huh? So that's a little bit there. And at the end is, uh, of course, is our Kunti prayers, which we have watched at the temple as a CD uh, many times. And uh, it has actually, that, that has been a very successful uh, very successful uh, rendition of uh, Kunti's prayers and it has clocked up uh, uh, quite a lot of views uh, it's 10 years old and uh, from the technical point of view it is not 79,000 views. Well, that is not bad. 79,000 views. And if you get a chance, it's at the end of last week's recording, Samir. And if you get a chance, look, have a look through the comments. There are some really hard churning comments huh, of people are so much moved huh, uh, to tears and this and that. Huh. Beautiful comments. Huh. Oh, okay. Let's start off with the Bhagavatam. Ben, do you want to start off tonight with the first verse? Yeah, I'll do it. You just let me know what, what, what the verse is and then I, I'll... It's, uh, it's in the chat. It is a 27th verse. I'm reading, I'm reading it from Hardback. Uh, okay. I've got One, the, 1827. 1827. Kunti's prayers. All these verses are very, very famous and very important verses. These are key verses in the whole of Bhagavatam. Okay. Can you hear okay. me? Can you can you hear me all right? People? You coming over very nice. Last week, okay. last session, we had really some internet problem. I hope we be all right today. You very clear. Okay, go ahead. The microphone is yours. Okay, uh, reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter eight, text twenty seven, entitled "The Prayers of Queen Kunti." Um, begin by the. Uh, by the invocation to Shri Vyasadev. Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimari Bhakti Namaste Sarasvati Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Namo Kinchana Vitaya Nirvritta Guna Vrittaya Nirvrita guna vritta ye atmaramaya santaya kaivalya pataye nama kaivalya pataye nama I hope that pronunciation was okay. Yeah, I would say it's uh, not nirvrita, nivrita. There is no R. Oh. Rest nivrita, is just... nivrita guna vrit, 
Tayyeh. Yes, great. Fantastic. Translation. Translation. I offer my, uh, my obeisances are unto you, who are the property of the materially impoverished. You have nothing to do with the actions and reactions of the material modes of nature. You are self-satisfied and therefore you are the most gentle and are master of the monists. Purport by the Divine Grace, say Sri Bhaktivedanta Swami Sri Vila Prabhupada. A living being is finished as soon as there is nothing to possess. Therefore, a living being cannot be in the real sense of the term a renouncer. A living being renounces something for gaining something more valuable. A student sacrifices his childish, childish proclivities to gain better education. A servant gives up his job for a better job. Similarly, a devotee renounces the material world, not for nothing, but for something tangible in spiritual value. Srila Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Srila Raghunath Das Goswami, and others gave up their worldly pomp and prosperity for the sake of the service of the Lord. They were big men in worldly sense. The Goswamis were ministers in the government service of, of Bengal, and Srila Raghunath Das Goswami was the son of a big Saminda of, this, of his time. But they were left every but they left everything to gain something superior to what they previously possessed. The devotees are generally without material prosperity, but they have a very secret treasure house in the lotus feet of the Lord. There is a nice story about Srila Sanatan Goswami. He had a touchstone with him, and this stone was left in a pile of refuge. A needy man took it, but later on wondered why the valuable stone was kept in such a neglected place. He therefore asked him for the most valuable thing, and then he was given the holy name of the Lord. A kinchina means one who has nothing to give materially. A factual devotee or Mahatma does not give anything material to anyone because he has already left all material assets. He can, however, deliver the supreme asset, namely the personality of Godhead, because he is the only pr property of a factual devotee. The touchstone of Sanatan Goswami, which was thrown in the rubbish, was not the property of the Goswami, otherwise it would not have been kept in such a place. This specific example is given for the neophyte devotees just to convince them that material hankerings and spiritual advancement go ill together. Unless one is able to see everything as spiritual in relation with the Supreme Lord, one must always distinguish between spirit and matter. A spiritual master like Srila Sanatan Goswami, although personally able to see everything as spiritual, set this example for us only because we have no such spiritual vision. Advancement of material vision or material civilization is a great stumbling block for spiritual advancement. Such material advancement entangles the living entity in the bondage of a material body followed by all sorts of material miseries. Such material advancement is called an arta, or things not wanted. Actually, this, this is so. In the present context of material advancement, one uses lipstick at the cost of 50 cents. And there are so many unwanted things 
which are all products of the material conception of life. By diverting attention to so many unwanted things, human energy is spoiled without achievement of spiritual realization. The prime necessity of human life, the attempt to reach the moon, is another example of spoiling energy. Because even if the moon is reached, the problem of life will not be solved. The devotees of the Lord are called akinchanas because they have practically no material assets. Such material assets are all products of the free modes of material nature. They, fo they, they foil spiritual energy. And thus, the less we possess such, such products of material nature, the more we have a good chance for spiritual progress. The Supreme Personality of Godhead has no direct connection with material activities. All his acts and deeds, which are exhibited even in this material world, are spiritual and without affection for the modes of material nature. In the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord says that all his acts, even his appearance and disappearance, in and out of the material world are transcendental, and one who knows this perfectly well shall not take his birth again in this material world, but will go back to Godhead. The material disease is due to hankering after and lording it over material nature. This hankering is due to an interaction of the free modes of nature. And neither the Lord nor the devotees have attachment for such false enjoyment. Therefore, the Lord and his devotees are called Nivriti Guna Vriti. The perfect Nivrita Guna Vriti is the Supreme Lord because he never becomes attracted by the modes of material nature, whereas the living, the living beings have such a tendency. Some of them are entrapped by the illusory attraction of material nature. Because the Lord is the property of the devotees, and the devotees are the property of the Lord, reciprocal, reciprocally, the devotees are certainly transcendental to the modes of material nature. That is the natural conclusion. Such unalloyed devotees are distinct from the mixed devotees who approach the Lord for mitigation of miseries and poverty or because of inquisitiveness and speculation. The unallied devotees of the Lord are transcendentally attached to one another. For others, the Lord has nothing to reciprocate and therefore he is called Atmarama, self-satisfied. Self-satisfied self as he is, he is the master of all monists who seek to merge into the existence of the Lord. Such monists merge within the personal effulgence of the Lord, called the Brahma Jyoti. But the devotees enter into the transcendental pastimes of the Lord, which are never to be misunderstood as material. Hare Krishna, that was quite a bit of a purpose. Thank you very much, Ben. If you would want to pick a point from this purpose, which one do you feel appeals to you most? Well, it's, uh, I think the, the, um, uh, the, statement that uh, the devotee, he has, uh, well, the pure devotee, he has nothing. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's called Akinchina. Uh, he has nothing to give materially. Um, and he doesn't want anything material. Um, the example that was given about the uh, Srila Sanatana Goswami and the touchstone as well. That was uh, 
that was interesting as well, you know, because the Studstone had the power to bestow wealth, prosperity, and ha material uh, happiness. But uh, Sanatan Goswami, he treated with almost contempt by keeping it in a place where there was was the moochie and the unclean place. So it wasn't to a, to a pure devotee. It wasn't considered to be of any value at all. So then the, and Prabhupada in his purport, he's making, he's being, making distinctions between different degrees of devotees as well in terms of uh, uh, the pure devotee, uh, their, their qualities and characteristics and other devotees as well. Could you say something about, uh, yes, uh, uh, such unalloyed devotees are distinct from the mixed devotees who approach the Lord? Uh, who are the mixed devotees? What is, a, what is in the mix? Well, I mean, if we, if we, if we go to the Bhagavad Gita and uh, we go to chapter 7 and uh, we we look at the the, the verses that uh, discuss uh, the four types of uh, pious people or so-called mahatmas um, um, living beings that that surrender to the lord um, the distressed you know the person who is in need of material uh, remuneration someone who's who's uh, um, who's naturally quite inquisitive about what uh, what right life is really all about and uh, you have people who are they are quite uh, learned and uh, it's like the So in want of what? Sorry? Uh, we had, you, you described two categories. Uh, the inquisitive one, huh, he wants to know, and uh, the one who's suffering, he wants relief of his suffering. So I said two more. Yeah, there's uh, the distressed person as well, someone who's suffering a lot. Yes, you had said, but what, what else? Um someone who is like a is like a like a gani someone who is in knowledge but they want more knowledge yes and what is left i mean i i, I only knew the distressed and someone who's seeking uh, uh wealth wealth that that's a number four The one who's seeking wealth. Yes. Two, different ca 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 two different categories because you have living entities, they're, they're suffering and they're in distress. So they are calling out to the Lord for help, to help them. And then you have people, they want uh, to be uh, materially, uh, they want wealthy. to be wealthy, you know, materially well off, you know. Then you have the, the the inquisitive, and then you have the gani. Yes, in, in, in want knowledge. for knowledge. Yes, and Samir, then, can I just call Samir? You had your hand up. Yeah. Oh, you're broken up. No, we cannot hear a word. What you're saying? Um, we covered it. Uh, can you hear me? Not well. Can you hear me now? Maybe a bit better. Say again. Yes. Can you hear me? No. There's lots of distortion and artifacts and uh, the internet in, in Africa is not great today, it sounds like. Okay, Ben, I was asking, not yeah. for the four types of men, huh? I was asking yeah. for the mixed devotees in comparison to the pure devotees. 
what is a mixture? There are two types. Uh, there's a uh, Karma Mishra Bhakta and uh, Jnana Mishra Bhakta. Exactly. Meaning what? Well, they have uh, devotees who are uh, they're worshiping the Lord, but it's like a it's like a business transaction almost. You know, mm. Allah, you know, they'll perform service and bhakti, but they want uh, they want to be remunerated. It's like a like a, almost a, an employee uh, type of relationship. They're prepared to do service, but they want to be uh, reimbursed for the service. So it's not it's not a pure uh, selfless uh, service. It's a selfish uh, service because it's motivated by personal want and uh, need as well. Wow. In that sense, and then. Uh, the Gyana, Gyana Mishra Bhaktis, they are, they are, they are only, they are, they are seeking to be knowledgeable. So they are, they, are, they want knowledge. Yes, yes, okay. <clears throat> of course, this Karma Mishra Bhakta, he wants something materially from the Lord as well. That can be of various degrees. It's not just uh, all or nothing. Uh, one may have a lot of material desires and one may have just a very few material desires. And of course, we mentioned that many times and I remember Dharma made some point some long time back. Huh? Uh, but there is a verse also which says uh, a karma what is that? Let's let's see if we find that. Akama. Akama Sarva Kamo Va. Moksha Kama Udaradi Tibrena Bhakti Yogena Chayate Purusham Param. Srimad Bhagavatam, second canto, third chapter, text ten. A person who has broader intelligence, whether he be full of all material desires, without any material desires, or desiring liberation, must by all means worship the supreme whole, the personality of Godhead. So that is uh, a little bit uh, a different perspective on that. Of course, we aiming all for unalloyed, pure devotional service. Huh? But we, if we are in a mixed state, uh, still, of course, we contacting Krishna. If we are, it's not that we are mixed or we cannot contact Krishna. No, Krishna conscious for everyone, even those who are in a mixed state. But we should aim to get free from the mix and aim towards pure devotional service. Okay, thank you, Ben. Welcome, Rashmi. And we had Tulsi nut for very short and then he disappeared again. So, is there anything else to be said? Rashmi, we are on the Bhagavatam uh, text, 8th chapter. Text. I would like to say a point about it again. Yeah. Text 27, Rashmi. Yeah. 1827. Okay, Ben, what you would like to say? Yeah, about the, um, you know, the statement, there is a statement in the purport. Uh, how, just to make that, just to make a kind of um, comparison, if you like, that material life is is uh, completely back to front from from uh, spiritual life. And uh, the point Prabhupada makes about the advancement of, uh, of material vision or material civilization is a great stumbling block for spiritual advancement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a complete opposite. Um, in saying that, you know, the more uh, the society and the world, it's uh, making material advancement. At the same time, um, uh, this entangles the living, the living beings into bondage uh, of the material body. And uh, this is 
compounded by the by all sorts of material uh, miseries. So yes. it's like he's he's making the point that it's not it's not wanted, but I mean the I mean questions could arise from that to say well. Um, because we are in this material world, I mean, uh, material, in a sense, material knowledge is uh, is continually uh, progressing as well, isn't it? You know, what they knew 50 years ago, say, compared to the knowledge they have now about things. And uh, you could argue, or you could... You could put forward a case that uh, by uh, developing all these kind of material knowledge, it's helping people um, in a material way in terms of the body, although it's not it's not really helping spiritually. But uh, it could a lot of people could see it from a perspective that, well, you know, we can't just allow. We can't allow living entities to suffer. We have to try to to help each other, you know, because we're, yeah, not, but so advanced. No, we're not so advanced that we're, we're, we're seeing everyone as spirit soul. But when people have this material body, the concomitant factor is that, you know, it comes with uh, the, four, the four things, you know, that obviously is born and then you know, it gets it it gets old, and in various stages can get diseased. And I mean, ultimately, we'll leave this body. But you know, in yes, the disease, okay. in disease condition, you know, it's like there's a there's like a you know, you could put forward the the. Uh, the statement that you know we need to advance yes. material knowledge to help that's that's okay. the point i was trying to make okay thank you very much of course we know also that uh, suffering we cannot stop uh, we can only move from if we mitigate one suffering in us the suffering comes up and we, we are uh, bound Actually, for a devotee, pain is unavoidable. Suffering is optional. Samir, let's see how your internet connection is. Hare Krishna, can you hear me now? Say a little bit more. Can you hear me? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Not really. Hare Krishna. He's got too much echo and reverb in the background. And not only it slows down and then it's disjointed and something is missing. Uh, are you in a different place tonight than usually? No, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, now we don't hear nothing. I'm in the same place. No, it is impossible to understand even a single word. Can you hear us? Can you hear me now? Okay. Can you hear us? Samir, can I you can hear, hear you very clearly. Yeah, so oh, one, one way it's okay, but not the other way. It's uh, your internet. Uh, Okay, I want to just visit one point. Srila Prabhupada writes in his quite long purport, unless one is able to see everything as spiritual in relation with the Supreme Lord, one must always distinguish between spirit and matter. So that is a very important statement. Uh, as long as we cannot see everything as spiritual, that vision, that vision can be achieved. What is the what is this statement? Uh, In the purport, uh, at the beginning, somewhere. 
it's a long purpose, difficult to pinpoint it, unless one is able to see everything as spiritual in relation with the Supreme Lord. One must always distinguish between spirit and matter. So that is our situation. We must distinguish between spiritual, spirit and matter. And sometimes this distinguishing is not that easy. Huh? There are some borderlines. Uh, it appears like it's spiritual, but actually it's material. It appears like something is material, but actually it is spiritual. So uh, how can we... Uh, distinguish properly between spirit and matter. Rashmi, what would you say? How can we distinguish between spirit and matter? Now you say, Rashmi, Hare Krishna. Prabhuji, I didn't get your question. The question is, how can Srila Prabhupada writes here in his purport, unless one is able to see everything as spiritual, in relation with the Supreme Lord. One must always distinguish between spirit and matter. So the question is, how can we distinguish between spirit and matter? How can we understand some borderlines? What is spirit? What is matter? Sometimes it is not that easy. Very hard. No, it is. See, we can understand it, but to put it into practice, for example, this body, this body is only matter. But it's only matter. There's nothing. This body, if there was no soul in it, there would be no consciousness in it. It is only made of those five material elements. So we are able to distinguish that this is, when we read the Bhagavad Gita, we are able to distinguish that this is the body and this is me, me the conscious person. I am the soul. But when it actually comes to practice it, if somebody dies, let's say, we are still full of grief if we are not able to reconcile the fact that that matter has that matter is gone back to the material elements but and it is the soul which has left the soul never dies so it is very hard to distinguish i guess by when you are con when you are very in a very pure pure stage of bhakti you are able to discriminate like that okay thank you very much, you very much. uh done your hand is up <clears throat> uh, yeah, Hari Krishna. Um, just going to say about spirit and matter. Okay. Um, spirit is something which is permanent. It's um, in its original state. Um, it's always satisfied. It's blissful. Um, whereas matter is temporary, and it's subject to the surrounding conditions so it can be affected by adverse conditions or good conditions so um, spirit has this um, um, quality of permanency it's always Darn, we have a lot of background noise <laughs> we've got background noise is your window open yeah yeah it is that makes a difference yeah <clears throat> uh, yes, I get your point. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you for that. Yes. Uh, ben, your hand is up, but very short. We want to move on. Um, I think in this statement that Prabhupada is making about uh, unless, unless, um, unless someone is able to see um everything as spiritual in relation with the supreme lord he's what he's actually describing is that as a pure state of krishna consciousness thank you yes he's it describing is... what it means to be krishna conscious um in the sense that in what he's saying he's saying so if, if i mean in a way, it's like a, a, a test. If we're still seeing things materially, uh, um, then we are dis we are discriminating between spirit, spirit and matter. So that's not that's not uh, that's not uh, Krishna consciousness. Um, but when we see everything in relation to the Supreme Lord Krishna, 
then we're beginning to see everything. We're, 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 as we see things in relation to Krishna, then we're beginning to see everything spiritual. Yes, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, yes, that is a fact. Uh, it, Rashmi, you mentioned the body is material, huh? but uh, just to see the intricacies of all of that, if the body is fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, it's actually not material anymore. It's spiritual. Huh? Or let's take a very obvious uh, example. Huh? The, the food offered to Krishna is food, it's material. But as soon as it is brought in contact with Krishna, it is spiritual. So the distinction between spirit and matter is not always that easy to see. Therefore, we need the association of devotees uh, who can help us if there is a, a borderline, if something appears spiritual but we are not quite sure, then devotees will help us, the Sangha of devotees, to make this distinction. What is spirit? What is matter? Until we come to that point that we see uh, we are fully Krishna conscious and we see everything in relation to Krishna, and that will grow in our spiritual journey more and more. We will see everything in relation to Krishna, and uh, that is spiritual. And uh, Rashmi's point was also very relevant that to know the distinction between matter and spirit is one thing, that is gyan, knowledge. But to practice it, uh, like uh, example R Rashmi gave, with when someone passing away, and uh, even so Bhagavad Gita says, a wise man doesn't lament neither for the living nor the dead, and so on, still we are filled with grief. Uh, uh, not only uh, sadness of having lost that person's association, but much more. So, to realize that knowledge, that gyan, that is called vikyan, realized or practiced knowledge, and that we should aim for, and that practicing that knowledge of Krishna consciousness, of course, starts with chanting Hare Krishna. That is a prime practice. If we uh, reading and reading and discussing Bhagavad Gita and uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, but we don't chant Hare Krishna, then that is all just uh, knowledge without uh, book knowledge. Srila Prabhupada writes at uh, some very interesting purport, uh, he writes, uh, book knowledge is useless. So, the aim of Krishna Consciousness, and our aim here also in the Sangha, to inspire, to practice that knowledge, to put it into practice. And then we, we need the association of devotees to put that knowledge into practice, uh, to get that inspiration. And as I said, that uh, putting that knowledge into practice starts with chanting Hare Krishna. And anybody who has started uh, of chanting this Maha Mantra Hare Krishna seriously, a fixed number of rounds, whatever the fixture of rounds may be, and increasingly uh, increasing that number up till 16, eventually. So then one will actually get the realization, uh, not only from that is a uh, so, moving from Gyan and book knowledge to Vigyan and realized knowledge. So let's stop here uh, on this uh, point and move on. There is one more. Uh, maybe someone has an answer to that. Srila Prabhupada writes, the Supreme Personality of Godhead has no direct connection with material activities. All his acts and deeds which are exhibited even in this material world, are spiritual and without affection for the modes of material nature. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord has said all his acts, even his appearance and disappearance, in and out of the material world, are transcendental, and one who knows this perfectly shall not take his birth again in this material world, but will go back to Godhead. 
So that's an important statement because if we know uh, Krishna's appearance and disappearance out of this material world, then we shall not take another birth again. That is very significant. It's very practical. Which Bhagavad Gita verse are we talking about? This we want to know. This is obviously a, a very important verse. Samir, I hope your connection is okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, one who knows my appearance and disappearance. Uh, one to who knows my... No, one who knows my activities um, doesn't again take birth after being this body. Something like that. Yes, something like that. Uh. Anyone knows a little bit more? Some, Rashmi, what about you? One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities, so both appearance and activities, does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, or Arjuna. So, Srila Prabhupada is referring to this verse. Anyone knows the Sanskrit? It's also quite well known. Bhagavad Gita 4.9. Samir. Your hand is up, Samir. Or still up or newly up again. Okay, Rashmi, what is that verse? 4.9. Can you find it? 4.9? The Sanskrit? Prabhuji, I my Bhagavad Gita is upstairs. Do you know it? Do you, do you hear, hear about it? Yes, Chanma yes, karma chame divyam. Right? You can even make it make it from the Hindi. Chanma karma chame divyam. Evam yo veti tatvatahat. Chaktva deham puna chanma. Naitimam eti sorchuna. Again, one who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in this material world, but attains my eternal abode, O Arjuna. So, important verse, a key verse of Bhagavad Gita, well worth remembering, um, even the translation or even with the Sanskrit, so better, and very relevant. Because if we really understand Krishna's appearance and disappearance in this material world, we will go back home to Godhead at the end of this lifetime. Okay, so that was that reference to Bhagavad Gita. Anything more? Any other question to that verse? Or shall we move on to text? I, I, I put my hand up, but you didn't. I don't think you noticed it. No, I haven't. Do you have another question, Ben? No, I just wanted to um, uh, say in relation to something that you talked about, um, because you mentioned about book knowledge being useless. Yes. I mean, this is a statement from Prabhupada. Yes. So my question is... Um, that there's nine limbs of bhakti, and the most important one is hearing. Mm. Now, we're not hearing ordinary books. We're listening to, this is spiritual knowledge, this is transcendental knowledge. Uh, it's one of the, one of the sources of becoming, um, helping us to become more aware and more realized in Krishna consciousness, isn't it? So for us, hearing Bhagavatam is, I mean, there's many other, uh, so much stress is on this uh, this um, activity. Uh, I mean, Lord Chaitanya, he, he, he made this a uh, very strong point that the devotee should, uh, should listen to Bhagavatam. 
so I, that this is what I'm obviously my question is around is it useless to read the books is, 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 I mean are, are we in the process of hearing are we hearing transcendental noise are we listening are we listening to spiritual knowledge so it's like can you okay I understand thank you very much uh, of course nobody here present tonight or every night is uh, has no vigyan. Everyone has some percentage, some amount of vigyan and kyan. Yes, hearing is important, huh? but the next shravanam is kirtanam. And as soon as uh, the kirtanam, there is Vishnu smaranam. So there is, there is realization. There is realization automatically. If we hearing submissively, and if we uh, chanting, uh, speaking Krishna Katha or chanting Mahamantra, there is bound to be realizations. Uh, if we Vishnu Smaranam, that's already a realization. It's only because I've heard other statements and uh, that, uh, like, just by hearing, just by hearing, you know, where the, 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 the effect and the potency of uh, this uh, knowledge is uh, imperceive, in, imperceptive and inconceivable, you know. Um, yes, you know, I mean, I that, that really applies to someone, let's say an academic may read the same Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam, but has absolutely no realizations. He's just studying it as an academic textbook. That is one it, thing. But in a sense, because the Lord is in our heart, and the, the Lord is in the academic heart as well. So, but uh, the Lord may not reveal Himself in the academic heart due to pride and due to um, even atheistic nature. And the Lord uh, reserves uh, the right, His right to reveal Himself. Huh? So one actually has to be a devotee. The academic will not get. Uh, much out of just uh, hearing or reading uh, Vedic scriptures or reading Bhagavatam, or Bhagavatam, he will not get actually an entrance into the mysteries of Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. But does does he does he accumulate Agatha Sukriti? Yes, yes, there will be some, but that will take a long time. So there's a purifying effect, even if one is aware of it or not. Yes, you know it's like uh, the the Maha Mantra is 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 acting whether one is consciously yes. aware of it or not. So yes, Akyata Sukriti is, and Sit Sukriti will bring eventually that person to become a devotee. Okay, Hare Krishna. Let's move on. Text twenty eight. Rashmi, you want to take text twenty eight? One eight. 28. Are you there? Yes, Prashu? Okay. yes Prabhuji. Text number 28 of chapter 8, Prabhuji, correct? Yes. Manye twam twam kalam ishanam anandi nidhanam vibhum samam Charantam Sarvetra Sarvatra Bhutanam Yanitha Kalihi Translation My Lord, I consider your Lordship to be eternal time. The Supreme Controller without beginning and end, the all pervasive one. In distributing your mercy, you are equal to everyone. The dissensions between living beings are due to social intercourse. Dissension. Purport, Kunti Devi knew that Krishna was neither her nephew nor an ordinary family member of her paternal house. She knew perfectly well that Krishna is the primeval Lord who lives in everyone's heart as the super soul Paramatma. Another name of the Paramatma feature of the Lord is Kala or eternal time. Eternal time is the witness of our actions, good and bad, and thus resultant reactions are destined by him. 
It is no use saying that we do not know why and for what we are suffering. We may forget the misdeed for which we suffer at this present moment, but we must remember that Paramatma is our constant companion and therefore he knows everything past, present and future. And because the Paramatma feature of Lord Krishna destines all actions and reactions, he is the supreme controller also. Without his sanction, not a blade of grass can move. The living beings are given as much freedom as they deserve, and misuse of that freedom is the cause of suffering. The devotees of the Lord do not misuse their freedom, and therefore they are the good sons of the Lord. Others who misuse freedom are put into miseries destined by the eternal Kala. The Kala offers the conditioned souls both happiness and miseries. It is all predestined by eternal time. As we have miseries uncalled for, so we may have happiness also without being asked, for they are all predestined by Kala. No one is therefore either an enemy or friend of the Lord. Everyone is suffering and enjoying the result of his own destiny. This destiny is made by the living beings in course of social intercourse. Everyone here wants to lord it over the material nature and thus everyone creates his own destiny under his under the supervision of the Supreme Lord. He is all pervading and therefore he can see everyone's activities. And because the Lord has no beginning or end, he is known also as the eternal time Kala. Thank you very much, Rashmi. Can you say a few words about that? Uh, this is, um, so here Kunti Devi is talking about basically karma. This is all karma. The puppet is karma. Here in her translation, in the, her translation, she's uh, telling the Lord that you are eternal time, Kal. So Krishna is, ka, is also known as Kal. He's the Kal. He's time. Uh, he's the supreme proprietor, controller. And he's all pervasive. So as Paramatma, he pervades every, every living entity, every atom, every, every molecule. But she's saying that he is equal to everyone. So be it devotee, non-devotee, animal, tree, leaf, whatever it is, he is still equal to, he is impartial. Even if it is, it is his devotee, he is impartial. Uh, he is impartial in his actions towards the devotee and whatever the dissension so whatever we are suffering or we are enjoying uh, that is it is our own doing so we have created our destiny so that is the translation and in the purport Prabhupada is explaining about how we are this karma philosophy which we are all very we, we are very well aware of uh, the karma how uh, we have we decided that we were envious. So to start with, we were envious of Krishna. We did not want to accept him as God. We did not want to accept him as the supreme controller, proprietor. We thought we are the doers. We forgot that we are not the doers. We are only doing it because of the, under the influence of ignorance and under the influence of the three modes. Um, and as a result of whatever we do, we suffer for, we get a reaction, good or bad, whatever we are doing, we get a reaction. Now, Krishna is not responsible for the reaction. He is not, he is, uh, the, the, the soul is not the doer, but neither is Krishna the doer. He is not, give, he is not made us do anything good or bad. We are acting under the modes and as a result, Kala is giving, uh, we are getting a reaction as a result. And Krishna is just supervising, he is watching, he is as a witness, as Paramatma, he is just witnessing. So in indirectly, yes, it's his sanction, but directly he has no involvement. But uh, uh, recently, um, I cannot remember which verse it was, but in Chaitanya Charitamrita, there was in the purport, uh, Krishna has, uh, uh, Prabhupada, sorry, has said that though this statement is very true, that Krishna is impartial, uh, towards everyone, so he's not he's not favoring going to favor his devotees uh, and not favor his non devotees. However, when it comes to giving a reaction, the sanction uh, it 
uh, when it comes to his um, devotees, Krishna will say, I will personally overlook everything. Whereas if you're a non-devotee, you're not, you don't want to know Krishna, you don't want to uh, come be sub subordinate to him, then Krishna will lead, let material nature deal with that living entity. But when it's the, that particular soul has now taken a shelter of Krishna, then Krishna will... Um, he will not still be impartial, but he will take over. He will intervene in the affairs, in the reactions even of that devotee. So, uh, for example, uh, uh, you, Prabhuji, have told us so many times that, you know, when we get hurt a little bit, then we say that this, this thumb has got cut today, but maybe my entire arm was supposed to be chopped off. But Krishna has intervened and he has reduced that reaction simply because... Um, because we are his devotees. Okay, thank you very much, Rashmi. Um, may I just ask before um, I come to you, Ben, uh, what or which Bhagavad Gita verse that Krishna is just uh, impartial or Krishna is not, uh, Krishna is rewarding everybody but accordingly? I know, I know this one. I know yes. this one. Yes, which one is it? It's 929. No. 929. Um, okay, what is 929? I envy no one, nor am I partial to anyone. I am equal to all, but whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend in me, and I am a friend to him. Yes, that is a very fitting verse that Krishna is not impartial. But what I want to say, there's another important Bhagavad Gita verse, uh, where Krishna is saying, I reward everyone accordingly, according to someone's surrender. And also, very uh, famous. Ya, ya yathamam prapadyante, that one? Ye yathamam prapadyante. As I don't know the re rest of it. As all surrender unto me, I reward them, I, I reward them accordingly. And? And whoever renders service unto me, no, that's that. That's, that I was going to <laughs> end of that one. <laughs> Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita. Rashmi, what's the full Sanskrit? Ye yatamam prapatyante. Rashmi? I can't remember, Prabhuji. I just remembered the first line. Okay, so that's, that's good if you know the first line. We can. Hare Krishna Prakash has to go. It's getting very late. I think he said it was 40, 40, some, 40 something yeah, degrees yeah. in Delhi. Hare Krishna. I know which verse that is now. 411. 411. Go, say the Sanskrit. Uh, say the Sanskrit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ye yata mam prapadyanti tam istitaiva bajamiya mama vartmanu vartantante manushya parta sarvasya. Yes. As all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, of son of Parta. Prita, yes. That or Parta. Yes, Parta or son of Prita. Uh, this uh, is a key verse. It, it would be very good to remember, said, Ye yatamam prapatyante, or at least the first line, because you know the first line, you can easily look it up. And uh, we can remember the translation at least as much as all surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects of son of Prita. Not very difficult to remember that. It's, it's just such an important verse. Bhagavad Gita 4.11. Okay. That was nice. Uh, nice explanation, Rashmi. Uh, a short story. Ben, is your hand... Up again or still up? A short story. Srila Prabhupada writes here. Oh, sorry, I did. I forgot to take it down. Sorry. Okay. Srila Prabhupada writes here, We may forget the misdeeds for which we may suffer 
at this present moment. But of course, Paramatma Krishna will not forget her. So, Srila Prabhupada speaks somewhere in one of his classes. Uh, a child, you, or later on when you bit grown up, uh, your parents tell you, a, a, a child, you remember you, you played in mud and you put mud all over you. Huh? And uh, the young man or young woman says, no, no, I would never do a thing like that. Huh? That is not true. That has not happened. Huh? But the young man may not remember her, but that doesn't mean it didn't take place. So how much we do remember her? Our memory is very, very short. Huh? So parents at the time, huh? they remember very well when the child played in mud and put mud all over himself and everybody laughed and uh, they took him to take a shower. And so parents remember it took place. Huh? So an argument, I, f I forgot. That is not really an argument. Huh? We forget so many things. We don't even know what we did last, uh, yesterday, a day ago at exactly this time. Huh? We may forget the misdeeds for which we may suffer at this present moment. But we must remember that Paramatma is our constant companion and therefore he knows everything, past, present and future. So Krishna is remembered, just like the parents do remember that the child put, smeared himself with mud all over her, but the child doesn't remember her, the, the man. So. The argument, I don't remember, is not a very good one. Again, we don't remember so many things. Okay, Hare Krishna. Is there any, are oh, we running out of time? Huh? Uh, any more, any question or comments on me? I'm, I'm so sorry, um, but the internet connection was really miserable. I don't know what you can do to improve that. Are you on 4G, Samir? Yeah, Hare Krishna, Prabhu. No, uh, there's no 4G here. It's only H+. Plus. Whatever that is, I don't know. Right now, when you spoke, that was quite clear. But it's amazing. You can hear us very clear, but uh, once a recording is out, you listen to the recording, you really know how bad it sounded. Uh, not understandable anything really. So maybe set can be improved. I don't know. Okay. Is there anything more? Yes, no problem. Uh, ben, some very short. Otherwise, we're running out of time. We want anything her prayers. Rashmi, prepare yourself for the singer prayers. Ben, okay, last comment or question. No, I was just wondering why why Kunti would uh, I, um, there seems to be a lot of not personal um, um, attributes to the Lord in this uh, in this verse. Yes, I felt the same. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it uh, it appears like a bit of an impersonal slant, but it's just, uh, I mean, on the other hand, Srila Prabhupada says very clearly, uh, Kunti knew who Krishna was. Uh, he wasn't her nephew, he was the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and, and, and. But of course, that impersonal, what she is saying, Krishna is a Kala, and that is also true. So that yeah. is a balance. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Well, it, it's good that uh, you brought that up because I that came to my mind too. Okay, Rashmi, can we have Nisinga prayers to finish off the beautiful evening? Clap along or have katals or harmonium that are harmonium that is probably in the attic by now. Hare <laughs> Krishna. <laughs> yeah, it's probably too. Um, uh, we would love to hear you with a harmonium again. You're completely out of practice, I have a feeling. 
Yes, yes, I've completely, I've not done it for so many months. But you have taken to the practice of chanting 10 rounds of Hare Krishna Maha Mantra daily, and that is much more important. Okay, and you sing a pranam. Namaste Narasimhaya Praladala Dadaine Hiranyakashi Purvakshaha Shilatankana Kalaye Itonashimo Paratonashimo Yatayato Yamita Tonashimo Bahir Nashimo Ridaye Nashimo Nashim Mamadim Charanam Prapade Tabakara Kamala Vare Thank you, Hare Krishna. Beautiful Kirtan. We have just uh, four minutes left. Uh, I would like to know, Dharm, how is your Tulsi growing? Um, I've got the pot. I'm just going to get the soil. I haven't planted it yet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. When will you plant it? Um, let's say... Maybe wait, why don't you wait for an auspicious day? Why don't you plant uh, or sow your Tulsi seeds at the next Ekadashi? Uh, yeah. um, which is on Saturday, Apara Ekadashi. Get your soil ready, get your pots ready everything and plant them on Apara Ekadashi this Saturday. That would be nice and as an auspicious start and then water them nicely. Saturday, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you know what time this Ekadashi begins and when it, uh, when it ends? You asked that before, Ekadashi always starts uh, at, uh, at uh, sunrise. Sunrise in the morning, yeah. Yes, up till sunrise the day, the next day, morning. On the day of the Akadashi, it begins. So it doesn't begin at the midnight hour. No, no. The Vedic, time, the Vedic time doesn't go by the clock. So it's a sunrise <laughs> and then it's finished. The sunrise next day. And sunrise next day. Okay. Right. Vedic time is not going by the clock. It's going by the sun or by the moon. And the breakfast... Next time is uh, on 8.29. 
till 10, 16. So okay, also they, after, they after sunrise. Samir? Yes, Samir? Samir. Samir. Come in, Samir. Nothing. We should stop eating it before a certain time is recommended. Yes, I mean, me? yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's recommended that uh, the day before, uh, before a certain time, you should stop eating. What's the time? Um, it, it varies, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's saying really around about 8, 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. That is, that is natural. You don't eat after yeah. 6 or 7 uh, in, in the evening. It is not, oh, Ekadashi starts next morning by sunrise, uh, so let's have a big feast at 2 o'clock after midnight uh, or something. <laughs> no, not, yeah. not like that. We, we don't eat the last big meal in the evening. Usually I try to take my uh, meal at uh, 6 o'clock whatever I eat, uh, and not later, because it doesn't get digested. Uh, and that is, I'm sure, from the medical point of view, also quite right. Uh, no, I haven't eaten yes, anything. It's quite, yes? It's quite right, but uh, they do recommend, it's recommended, actually, just if you read, that yes. uh, before a certain time you should stop eating, because not everybody has their dinner at 6 o'clock. Most people sometimes, if they're working or whatever, they might have some food late. So it is recommended. I guess six or seven o'clock, even eight o'clock may be okay, but uh, not nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, uh, or one o'clock or two o'clock, or quickly waking up before sunrise, before Ekadashi, and eat a um, uh, big pizza or something. That is not really the idea. I think, Prabhuji, from Ekadashi point of view, I, yeah. I think I read somewhere that. The aim of eating early, the pre we should be eat, like you said, we should not be eating uh, late in the night anyway. But for ekadashi, especially, you don't want the food to be in remain in the stomach. You yes, don't want point. whatever you've eaten the previous day because certain foods do have very long transit times. So, good point. Good point. Yes, and we don't even ekadashi or not ekadashi. We don't want to have the food staying in the stomach all night long, huh? For uh, seven hours or. That's not very good. Okay, yes. So, Ekadashi starts with the sunrise and uh, ends with the sunrise. Hare Krishna. And here we stop. we ending also. So, the reason by the why I asked this question was because one time I was really hungry and it was midnight. And I wanted to eat, but I didn't eat. Okay. Then I did. I wasn't sure, is it okay to eat or is it not okay? I didn't. I, I had uh, I had like a, a real moment <laughs> where I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> well, I don't think it is the end of the world if that is once a year or something is overcoming you a huge appetite at midnight. But we, sh we should be sleeping at midnight, really. <laughs> okay, let's stop here on this note. And... Uh, We'll meet again on Saturday, and Saturday is Ekadashi, and these verses are very, very beautiful, and there are many more beautiful verses and Kunti prayers to come. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you, uh, Dharm, huh? and we're looking forward to your Tulsi planting. Thank you, Rashmi, and we'll see you on Saturday. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone.